Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Andrea Piero, Director of the Visiting Artist Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture by architect and founding director of the research agency, Forensic Architecture, I.L. Weissman. Each academic year, SAC's Visiting Artist Program hosts a variety of presentations by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars with the mission to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art and culture. Throughout its history, the program has served as a critical, re critical resource and inspiration for our community. And tonight, we are honored to have A.L. Weissman become a part of our rich history of distinguished guests who have spoken at the school. I would like to thank A.L. for taking the time out of his extremely busy schedule to visit the school and share his work with us um, this evening. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with the William Bronson and Gracie Slovet Mitchell Lecture Series and SAC's Department of Architecture, Interior Architecture, and Design Objects. I'd like to thank Director Jonathan Solomon and the department for their support, as well as the Illinois Arts Council Agency. At the end of the presentation, we'll have about 10 minutes to take three or four questions from the audience before the program concludes by 7.30. Please raise your hand if you have a question and our staff will circulate microphones for your use. We ask that if you're posing a question to please stand and share your name and keep your question concise. Also to note, if you are in the professional architecture community and are in need of AIA learning unit credits, please see the table in the lobby when you exit as there's a sign up sheet for you. So thank you again for joining us tonight, and now it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Jonathan Solomon, Director of SAC's Department of Architecture, Interior Architecture and Design Objects, to introduce I.L. Weissman. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome I.L. Weissman to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, an architect concerned in his words, not only with buildings, but rather with an ever-changing set of relations between people and things, his work is at the leading edge of both contemporary technology and politics, opening critical roles for architecture beyond its service of capitalism. <clears throat> Last week, the New York Times published an interactive feature. Every building in America presented by Tib Wallace, Derek Watkins, and John Schwartz from a Microsoft data set, presented a tantalizing abstraction of planning across the country's cultures of building and living. Smoothly scalable, but reductive in stark solids and voids, it dangled the promise of that image from Borges, a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it. There was some pithy uh, analysis along with the map that I ignored. Instead, I zoomed in and out, panned from my own neighborhood to others in Chicago, to distant and frankly less relevant places like Los Angeles and New York, re reading histories not in text, but in the language of architecture, figure and ground, presence and absence. I could see settler colonialism at work in the continental grid, evidence of cities swelling and reconfiguring in response to waves of immigration, generations of public housing built and erased, the use of infrastructure, and the leveraging of geography to divide neighborhoods by race and class. In fact, my ability to see and discern these features in the Every Building in America map, and also coincidentally in the empire that it represents point for point, is owed um, at least in part to another map I had seen exhibited at Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York City in spring of 2003, my last semester in graduate school. The map, part of the exhibition, A Civilian Occupation, was produced by Weizmann with the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem, and it laid bare the spatial tactics of occupation in the West Bank in terms that were clear and coldly objective. A few years later, in 2007, I read Weitzman's interviews with senior Israeli Defense Force commanders published in the paper Walking Through Walls. The paper explored the IDF's appropriation of, among other foundational texts in architectural theory of the 1990s, Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus and Bernard Schumi's Architecture and Disjunction in the Tactics of Occupation. An undeniable and unavoidable implication for me, of me, as an architect in that oppression. Since encountering Weitzman's work, 
I have not seen the map or the empire the same, either as an architect, a Jew, or an American. If Weitzman's work if Weitzman began his work demonstrating how architecture, understood both as buildings and as the relations between people and things, participates in oppression, the ongoing practice he founded, forensic architecture, has developed a new role for architecture to fight that oppression. Based at the University of London, where Weitzman is professor of spatial and visual cultures, forensic architecture is a research practice that brings together architects, journalists, software developers, scientists, lawyers, and others around investigations on behalf of international prosecutors, human rights groups, and political and environmental justice organizations. The work of forensic architecture is presented to courts and parliaments and in galleries and museums as a tactical way of making evidence public. While police forensics is a disciplinary project that affirms the power of states, writes Weitzman in the introduction to his 2014 edited volume, Forensis, The Architecture of Public Truth, the direction of the forensic gaze could also be inverted and used instead to detect and interrupt state violations. Meanwhile, buildings, Weitzman writes, in his more recent forensic architecture, Violence at the Threshold of Detectability, might be among the best censors of societal and political change, immobile, anchored in space, they are, close, they are in close and constant interactions with humans. They are exposed both to the elements outside them and to an artificially controlled climate within. And this besides embodying, of course, the political, social, strategic, and financial rationalities that went into their conception. For Weitzman, the coming together of forensics and architecture is an opportunity to redirect both. In inverting the forensic gaze, he also creates an opening for a new field of architectural work that appropriates its technologies, tools, and techniques for the pursuit of public truth. Buildings become the media for recording evidence that pushes the threshold of detectability. The 3D model, the digital scanner, the laser rule become tools of empowerment, while the rendered image, the orthographic drawing, the fly-through video become heralds of justice. Please join me in welcoming A.L. Weitzman. Well, it was such a nice introduction. Thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you, Jonathan, and I'm absolutely happy uh, to be here uh, again in Chicago. I seem to be coming once a year about uh, that uh, recently and, um, uh, and speak to you about uh, some of our recent work. Um, I guess um, one of the starting points um, is to start with a certain kind of contradiction that to a certain extent, I haven't been able to fully process. Um, growing up or maturing as, um, as a practitioner, as a thinker, in the context of the anti-colonial struggle in Palestine, um, it is really, when, when everything that we wanted to do was disrupt the mechanism and institution of state, the law, um, and various practices of domination, I find myself now, through forensic architecture, with a group of colleagues um, appealing on behalf of the law, on behalf of normative structures, on behalf of expertise and things like that. So what has happened recently that make that uh, shift somehow important? And I do think that an institution like forensic architecture, that kind of multidisciplinary somehow wild uh, conjunction of practices from uh, heritage conservationists, uh, open source journalists, uh, architects, artists, filmmakers, coders that, that compose our group today um, is essentially something that is, is uh, for us is a response to the moment, to the challenges of the present. Uh, and in particular, something that I think we in um, well, we, we in uh, sort of the um, people in, a, in, a, in, in the anti-colonial struggle in Palestine, but I think anyone that is dealing with conflict understands that some of what we have experienced all along in terms of a culture of denial, in terms of an attack on 
uh, verification in terms of um, um, just overt rejection of obvious truth that are in front of our eyes has been civilianized and existing now as the culture of the political mainstream. So what is referred to generally as the culture of uh, post-truth or uh, however um, that is being described here by those people that want to believe you that the truth has a history, that it's post, that it's something that is no longer um, operative, no longer relevant as a practice, um, is, is something we grew up with. And I think that it is important to understand that state violence in the frontier and state violence in conflict areas always was directed at two things. It was directed at people and things, and it is directed at the evidence that this violence has at all taken place. And to a certain extent, uh, practices of verification, or the reestablishing of the principle that um, truth practices could exist, they could exist using visual culture, using aesthetic practices, using art, architecture, science together, rather than having those um, discipline somehow in antagonism or confrontation, and they've been perhaps for too long um, in, in recent decades, uh, is essential because verification is a, a, a practice of, um, it, it's a truth practice to a certain extent that does not have a center, that is operating by synthesizing perspective, situated uh, knowledge and situated perspective of people that experience violence together with people that are in solidarity with them that can bring this skill or another uh, together to bear and that that act can become disruptive of, um, of state mechanisms of oppression. And if this is what we are seeking, sometimes within normative frameworks like human rights, international law, and others, there are disruptive elements to the extent that, uh, and whatever the equivalent is here, in your uh, fields of struggle against you know, the, the kind of domination you are uh, experiencing right now, um, that um, to the extent that in, in, in Israel-Palestine, we NGOs, uh, human rights groups, are considered the third strategic threat. I mean, to an extent that um, the government um, and its agencies and, and the people that support it um, would uh, effectively say they are uh, in a certain kind of uh, lawfare with us or that we are applying the law as a form of war against the state. Um, that um, NGOs insisting on accountability, on dignity, on human rights, on international law are uh, in fact uh, an existential threat to the state just as Iran or Hezbollah are uh, for Israel. So I think we need to understand that there is a certain um, disruptive force potentially if exercised correctly in what it is that we could do. And I'd like to, not, not, not to speak about it uh, too much, but um, to show you uh, a number of projects and start with a very detailed description of a particular very simple case that we have recently uh, returned to uh, using um, an invitation to exhibit uh, at, in a museum at a Tate in London. Uh, allowed us to open up a cold case in uh, in Israel, and um, uh, and uh, somehow show you through this relatively simple case the kind of principles uh, of our work and what uh, and what it is that could be done. So, the title of the lecture today, the long duration of a split second, is really an attempt to combine. Uh, an incident analysis with um, a kind of the, the uh, a critique of the larger structural uh, forces that underpin it. Um, the, the story begins on the 17th of January 2017. 
Uh, that night, uh, Palestinian Bedouin groups in the south of the country, in the Negev, are calling um, activists on Twitter and Facebook to come to the village because they're being raided by the police. So the police is sending, like in a military operation, hundreds of policemen entering into this Bedouin village. It has been illegalized. It is not considered to be a legitimate village. It is, um, uh, they, they are about to demolish it. Uh, activists there, both Palestinian, international, and Israeli activists are on the ground trying to resist uh, um, that event. Uh, what you see here in the middle of the night, commotions, etc., and all of a sudden uh, we're hearing uh, several shots. I don't know if you heard it uh, in, in the background. Uh, the woman who has recorded that, her name is Karen Manor. She is an activist, a member of a group called Active Stills. Um, these are people that believe in the power of uh, uh, documentation to be mobilized politically and build communities of practice. She's there on the ground. She's shooting 96 videos. Uh, what you see here on the timeline is uh, the durations of her different clips. She's switching a camera on and off uh, as she sees things uh, around herself. And um, because it's pitch dark, uh, she is not um, uh, fully, and nobody fully understand what has taken place. But we heard the shots before. Uh, when she hears the shots, uh, she actually switches on her camera for, for quite a longer period of time, and she takes cover, and when she keeps on hearing shots and sound, she realizes something important is happening, and after 14 seconds, she switches on uh, her camera again, and then for the rest of the night, what she hears and what you would hear is the beep of a car horn um, a continuously um, uh, honking. <laughs> This is the police now um, pushing the activists uh, away. We can hear also her breathing and her kind of like interaction with the police. We are trying, this is something that we've done later, we're trying to understand because everything that we see during the night is just lights moving around. We have produced a 3D model in which all those lights kind of coalesce somehow into a form um, and we are able to locate her videos in, in, in the model using some techniques that um, are not really as sophisticated as they look, but the creation of panorama, for example, uh, that, that, that traces both her movement in space and the panning of, of her video. Um, effectively locating these panoramas will later use to locate and to create those videos uh, that you see, to locate each one of those cars uh, in, uh, in the landscape. Uh, but effectively, she, uh, it's dark and she doesn't know. Let, let's hear her. It's all a total mess and I don't understand exactly what is going on. I keep hearing this beeping of the car that is next to me, but I cannot see the car. So throughout, she, she is shooting about 20 clips around that car. She hears the shot, people saying somebody getting shot, but she's that close to the, the car that you see here in the back with somebody, Yakub Musa Abu El Kian, a teacher, in fact, the deputy head of a school for Bedouin um, Palestinian children, uh, is bleeding to death in the car while the honk is effectively the sound of the horn is the sound of him uh, dying uh, within, the, within that car. She's that close, she's about 15 meters away, and she does not see um, the car and, and what has taken place. Um, the next day, this is the news we are all waking up to. Um, uh, some Israeli news are saying officer murdered in a Negev terror attack. What has transpired is that during that night, two people died, not only the Bedouin uh, man, Yakub Musa Kian, but Erez Levy, a policeman. And uh, the police is claiming that Yakub Musa Kian, being uh, upset by the uh, demolition or the intended demolition of his home, is going into his car 
and with the, um, with the lights off in the middle of the night, charges at the police, runs over Erez Levy, and uh, the police has no other option but um, to shoot him to, to death. Uh, and this is what they do. This is a tweet by the Israeli police uh, saying effectively uh, the story that I told you. Another very important character of this story is Ayman Ode, a Palestinian lawyer from Haifa, uh, the city where I grew up on, um, a man roughly my age. Um, he is now the head of the Communist Party, uh, which is one of four Palestinian parties in the Israeli parliament, or the Knesset, uh, that had to join together because the state continuously, or the parliament, continuously try to get them out of the parliament or any representation of Palestinians, what they try to do is to raise the percentage, the minimum percentage they, uh, for party to be represented. So all the Palestinian party joined together, created the joint Arab list. Ayman Ode is the head of which, and uh, he also responded to the call uh, of the villagers for solidarity. He was there on site and in another um, story that I don't have time to go into. He was wounded. He was shot with a uh, foam bullet to, to his head and he was beaten and pepper sprayed uh, by the police um, during that night. Uh, immediately later, uh, this person, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, is posting a condolences uh, Facebook post um, and repeats the allegation that there was a terror attack in the Negev and that what he's going to do is continue the destruction of terrorist home, i.e. Bedouin home, Bedouin being like the terrorist, and the denial of citizenship. This is like really, what, what is happening here is that this incident enters into an entire kind of um, uh, realignment of Israeli politics that, that become um, no longer tolerant of and uh, containing of Palestinian uh, uh, citizens of Israel, but an attempt to completely remove them from representation and, uh, in fact, denial of citizenship. This is, this is uh, um, as something that is uh, incredibly, um, uh, it's kind of like new in this sort of, in the rhetoric even of the extreme right of which Netanyahu is the, uh, uh, the representative of. I, that story now is going to be mobilized in the larger kind of political uh, force. Gilad Erdan, who is a kind of a stooge of Netanyahu, he's the minister of the police. He is actually directing now the fire against Ayman Ode, uh, the, the Haifa lawyer, the head of the Communist Party, and he said the blood is on his hand. Eh? The blood of Erez Levy, the policeman, comes out of the incitement of the Palestinian parties that are there on site apparently to um, incite more violence uh, against the police. Uh, the blood is on his hands. I mean, I thought we saw the blood is in his face. Uh, but that is what uh, the claim is. So again, this is entering, this is an attempt to delegitimize and effectively remove them from parliament, denial of citizenship, and other uh, such actions. Uh, in the funeral of Erez Levy, the chief of police goes even further and says, this is not only uh, a kind of, um, how do you say, an instinctive uh, sort of like an opportunistic terrorist attack, the, the teacher, the, the, the deputy, Yakub Musa Abulkian, the deputy uh, head of the school, uh, is um, Daesh, is a member of Daesh, is uh, ISIS. Um, and later it appears that uh, that allegation was made simply because they found some newspapers in his car that had a headline of something about some Daesh terrorist attack. As you know, I mean, it's. You, you'd find it hard to find a newspaper without a headline like that in, in recent years. So but they, they accuse him of, being, of belonging to Daesh and therefore uh, that is another kind of um, attempt to, to, to go at the villages and, um, and the victim. Um, this is the fastest uh, investigation we've done. Uh, we've stayed almost kind of overnight, and in sort of 24 hours, we wanted 
we, 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 we got in touch with uh, Karen, in fact, was sending us, Karen Manor, the activist who filmed the first bits, was sending us the material while she was there. Um, uh, we are uh, obviously in touch with this, in very close touch, both with the, having worked in, in that area before, both with the villagers and the activists. And um, we start uh, our analysis based on the first police error that, is, uh, that, 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 that they do. So at some point, the police wants to show that, uh, to prove that that was a terrorist attack. And what they've done is that they, they had a helicopter over at night. And the helicopter is the only thing that saw the scene because it has an, a thermal imaging. Uh, so it looks like daytime, but actually it kind of sees through the dark. Uh, the video taken from police helicopter shows the terrorist vehicle, right? Um, shows the terrorist vehicle on the side of the road. This is the terrorist vehicle, apparently, um, with its lights off, right? It's a thermal imaging. Why is the lights off? Who knows that the lights are on off? This is the mark the terrorist vehicle. And now they, they, they show how it charges towards the group of policemen and uh, run them over. Uh, it's going slowly with its lights off, uh, accelerates for no reason that wanting to run over the police. And uh, you see the, the body of the police here under, under the car. And then another police vehicle comes and, and stops it. Later that day, they release actually in, in lower resolution the um, thermal images without any annotation. So now, we have two things. We have Karen Mano, the activist who is on the ground who cannot see, but she can hear, right? She has the sound of what's going on, the shouting, the shooting, the beeping. And we have somebody who see, who cannot hear. The, the thermal imaging has no sound. What happened when you put simply a soundtrack over the image? First thing, you need to know how to synchronize it, how to, how to do that. So again, I'm kind of like taking a, 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 a short circuit through uh, a lot of uh, the investigation. Here is the, 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 the Manor's video. The sound is Manor. And what we see is on this policeman, we see um, we would see three or four uh, kind of like heat clouds coming, shots. Um, we hear those shots. We can synchronize the the, the, the pattern, the rhythm of the shots visibly and the rhythm of the shots on the, uh, on the video. And effectively now we have, because we have Karen Manor's uh, metadata, we have the time of each and every uh, of the activities that, that are taking place. So we see now those, those, uh, those shots. I'm gonna go a bit forward. Okay, 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 okay. Um, we can see here the vehicle coming in. Uh, these are people. Uh, people are registered on, yeah. on video as, as heat sources. This is why they look dark, darker than the background. The background is colder, it's white. Here, here are the shots. Um, but uh, let's, if you, if you look at the direction of the shots, the direction of the heat clouds, you can see that they are pointing directly towards the car at the time when the car is actually driving pretty slowly uh, and definitely before it runs over the police. So the entire police story doesn't make sense anymore. First the police shoots, then it goes over the car. Why and what happened, we don't know yet, but uh, the order of action is already uh, inverted. Now here you could see we're in the gap between, this is the 14 seconds when Karen has her video off. She's gonna connect now to the video, but we know how to sync it up, and we're gonna start hearing uh, some interesting things um, at the moment where uh, she switches on. So the, we start hearing again the beep, and we start seeing, here is the, this is, the, this is the car, and we start seeing policemen 
closing in on Yakumo Sabukian's vehicle. And as they get very close, they're careful, obviously, they're moving slowly. As they get close, um, it looks like one of the policemen has, a re has arrived, reached the, uh, the vehicle itself, uh, and then we're hearing a mysterious uh, gun sh another gunshot. I hope you heard that. Uh, there was a clear sound of a shot directly when the police arrive at the car. So the car is stopped already. Um, there is no risk anymore from what the police claim is the, 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 the trigger, the weapon of attack is the gas pedal on the car. Uh, that is no longer, um, the car is no longer moving and we hear that shot when the police is there. We do not know yet how to address it. We do not have more evidence than that. We'll return to that. In the meantime, we release the first part of our investigation is to say the police shot first. Um, we release it on a relatively small circulation. 972 is kind of like the vehicle, the, the news of the left, let's say, uh, in, in, in not only, it's not a mainstream, it's almost like a kind of like an activist blog. Um, and uh, we just don't have time to release it, to, to, to send it to the, to, to the big uh, newspapers. We just post it out there. Um, Ayman Ode, the head of the Communist Party, tweets it. And the police, like the last of the trolls, is responding to his um, tweet of our analysis saying, our edit is manipulative. It's distorting evidence, and nothing will change the fact that what you've seen is terror attack, and it's terror, terror, terror. Um, in the meantime, another piece of interesting news is being released, and there's a leak from the pathological report of the body of Yakub Musabul Kian. Apparently, he sustained a bullet wound to the knee, the same on to the right knee, the same leg that would have been on the gas pedal. So something here. Um, maybe because there, there is even in our analysis, you know, even if the police shot first, he might have survived the first shot and in retaliation press the gas and accelerate towards the police. But now we know that his leg uh, is possibly, we don't know when he sustained that bullet, uh, incapacitated. So questions are arriving and uh, the head of the police is being actually asked about it in the parliament, uh, in the Knesset, and he's saying, I will continue to tell the truth, despite there being members of the left, I suppose this is us, and um, uh, they, don't, they don't like it, no one will silence me, good night, etc. cetera. Uh, but then even like mainstream, not even mainstream, like right wing uh, newspapers, like the Jerusalem Post, uh, is starting to wonder if the story actually holds. New evidence intensified mystery around the Bedouin teacher killing, again, playing our, uh, our analysis, uh, etc. That still, but the story doesn't move. Um, we say that the police insists, um, the uh, minister in charge of the police insists, um, and he explains, the, the, the head of the police explains, that the pattern of movement of the Yakub Musab al-Kiyan in his car is that of a terrorist because he was driving, he was sneaking at the police with his lights off. So we are like trying to check this thing and we go back to all the videos that we had, not only Karen Manoz, but all other videos uh, that were there. And one of them actually was always under our nose, was an Al Jazeera, there was an Al Jazeera journalist there, standing very close, in fact, a friend of Karen Manor. Uh, and they're always more or less next to each other. And uh, Al Jazeera broadcast um, uh, about, about this, you know, but they used that bit of footage simply as a backdrop without actually even realizing what is in their image. And we thought that we might, that maybe this vehicle, we don't know where we are, it's all dark, that could be, there's many vehicles moving around, that could be Yakub Musa Abulkian's vehicle. But 
So we want to check it. So effectively, we start, again, the same story of attempting to synchronize now Al Jazeera video on the right with Karen Manor video on the left um, in order to um, kind of start to orient ourselves again uh, in the dark and see, see how it works. Uh, here are the moments of shots, and, and this is the, the moment of synchronization. Here, until now, we don't have the Al Jazeera video. Okay. Now Al Jazeera video begins, so her camera pans already to the other side. Al Jazeera camera is, is more on the scene, but we could actually just pick out at the, at the, at the backdrop, in both those cases, a car with two or four pixels in, in the front showing uh, the lights are on. Now, that is definitely not enough. How do we know that this is the vehicle? We need to locate it again in our model, and we see two policemen or two figures kind of silhouette against, and another two figures uh, later against the, the, uh, the car that seem to be uh, in, uh, in light. And uh, so the way to do it again, we need to locate it in, in, in our model. Again, architectural models are for us optical devices. They help us see, they help us synchronize uh, and make sense of multiple images. We have the model, we project the uh, thermal helicopter image on it, and we try to see if the people that we saw on the, uh, according to the, to the helicopter image, the, the location of the soldiers are compatible with the silhouettes that, that, that we saw, and indeed uh, they are, so we are absolutely certain that what we're seeing is Yakub Musab Kian's vehicle, and we're certain that the lights are on. Now, until now, our evidence, a, com a composite evidence, i.e. one that requires putting sound on image, um, was not convincing, no, I mean the state, and its ministers and the police could keep on pushing back because somehow the paradox is that the more the evidence is composed, the more it is vulnerable to accusation of it being manipulated, being edited tendentiously, uh, etc. When you have something simple, when they say the lights are on, uh, are off, and we say the lights are on, uh, the story starts uh, to crumble. And, um, here, indeed, they cannot maintain it anymore. Um, they did not try to deny that that was the car. That is the cartoon in uh, one of the Israeli uh, newspapers. The uh, minister in charge of the police tell the head of the police, I've got an idea, you will apologize, and I will accept your apology. And indeed, uh, he is uh, the minister, uh, public security minister, the minister of police, backtrack on whether the cop killing of Bedouin was terror, now he backtracked over his backtracking, but that's another story. Whereas another minister, the most right-wing minister indeed in the Israeli government representing the settlers, in fact already issues uh, an apology uh, to the villagers. Okay, so the, there is certain admission that maybe there wasn't um, uh, a terrorist attack, but what now would happen with a policeman that shot? And what with the last shot that we've seen? Um, we decided at that moment, it's the wrong moment to stop the investigation, uh, and we decide to keep on pushing. And, um, you know, it takes time, but uh, effectively we, we uh, when, you, when you undertake counter forensics, when you, counter forensic being investigation of the police investigation, you don't really have, access to the evidence. We don't have access to the car, for example, but there's been several um, photographs of the car during daytime when it is the, the, the car where uh, Yakub Musa Abul Kian died, and uh, we are able to combine them in, into a model to project the images onto a model in order to start seeing where the bullet holes uh, are and whether they are compatible with um, uh, it's whether whether the, the, the shot that uh, incapacitated the knee uh, is compatible with the um, uh, with the beginning of the journey, and um, we are locating effectively the model now of the vehicle 
within that space, and then we decide that what we need to do is actually together with the villagers uh, and together indeed with, um, uh, with uh, here, is, here is Ayman Oda, the, uh, the head of the Communist Party, together with us, everybody is coming to reenact that night uh, what has happened there. We take a vehicle that is the same vehicle uh, like the one, not, not a similar vehicle, not the same, um, because the same is with the police, but the same model. Uh, we locate it at the same place that we can find from the um, thermal imaging. We take, we, we work with actors, uh, we place them at the same uh, place, and, and we run a first scene of the reenactment is to see whether we could take away now from the police the very fact that there was any retaliation to the first shots, a, uh, any intentional acceleration. Again, you know, the police is claiming the trigger of attack is pushing the gas pedal. Now, we are asking what happens simply if at that point where the shots are fired, the leg would have been removed from the gas. So here we have a synchronized movement of the aerial image with the car. We, we simply remove the leg from the gas and we see that the car is, is rolling at precisely the same speed as uh, it did on, uh, on the image. Uh, moreover, we notice something quite curious thing in that process. While the car, because we start filming it also from inside, we film the process from inside the car, and we realize that when the car crosses 20 kilometers per hour, automatically, and this is probably protection, um, the doors lock from inside, right? So I'm gonna play it again. So now the camera is on that. So the, car, the, the door locks, we, we're still at that part of the journey. The door now is, is, is locked from the inside and when it is locked, obviously, uh, you cannot open it uh, from the outside. So if the door opened, it needed to open from the inside. Now we saw that the door was open. Um, so what happened at the moment when the police comes to, uh, to the vehicle? Um, we can see, again, let's, let's look again at the policeman getting close to the car. And at some point, um, if, we, if we increase it, we see a certain kind of cloud in a slow resolution that may suggest that the door is open. Now we think that, and we need to, to see the pathological report, but that at that moment, Yakub Musabkian opened the door at the request of the police and got shot in the chest. Uh, bled to death uh, for 20 minutes. This is what the, path the leaked pathological report revealed uh, when no, no one on the ground uh, was helping him. Here's again the shot. You'd see the door opening, or, or something might say that the door is opening, uh, and, 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 and the shot. So that again start playing uh, in, in the news, uh, but still, and despite all that, um, the unit that investigates the police the police investigation unit inside the police decides not to charge the policemen and close the file against them. Again, the same old logic of the split second that I think is very familiar here. Um, the reason they, they say whether he was a terrorist or not, they don't even um, uh, admit that anymore very clearly. Whether he was a terrorist or not is, not, is immaterial. The question of charging a policeman is whether they had ground to think in the split second of action that he might be a, poli a, a, a terrorist, i.e. driving while Bedouin in uh, the Negev. Uh, this is the man uh, who was killed. And um, the police instinct is um, what here is kind of like becoming the legal argument that uh, allows the case not to even reach court. Uh, at all. So I think in this case, perhaps um, 
Israel and uh, and the kind of the police policy here is two steps even behind um, the, the legal system here. There's not even entered uh, into the court. It is simply the police close the file uh, against the police. And now we are using this investigation together with the police brutality project in Israeli Committee Against Torture, uh, an NGO, to try and open that case, uh, to try to force the Supreme Court to open the case against uh, the policeman. But indeed, that logic of the split second, that logic that seeks to uh, naturalize an instinct that is always predominantly targeting a particular section of society in Israel, if you are Palestinian in the, in the occupied territory, if you are Palestinian in Israel uh, itself, the instinct against you being a terrorist or to consider you as a terrorist is justified. I, within the split second of the, of, the, of the instinct, of the incident, we start seeing reflected the history of colonization and the conflict in itself. And indeed, uh, what has taken place is the, the, that village, the file was closed and that village is being demolished. Um, Sorry, this is, this is just some, some um, shots from our uh, installation. It shouldn't have been here now, but uh, as I said, this, the, the material that, that we, of course, we couldn't bring it initially to court. We had to make it public in other ways, and we were using here um, the opportunity to show it to Tate to open up uh, this case. So now we're seeing here uh, effectively the demolition of that village. This is, this is uh, not the demolition of the entire village, but this is the morning after Yakub Masur al bukhiyan is effectively murdered uh, by the police. Uh, they're demolishing uh, both the house of his mother, the house from which he was driving out with his car, um, and, and other homes. Uh, this is his mother's house. This is where the vehicle came out. This is the slope here on the, on the, on the right-hand side and um, uh, the effective demolition of that. Uh, just to show you where we are, so these are the, the demolitions. Um, this is the rest of the village. It is now going to be the remaining houses uh, are, you know, any, any moment now going to be uh, demolished. But the story of Um al-Khiran is just one of uh, dozens, perhaps three dozens, of uh, villages, uh, Bedouin villages, uh, in the uh, northern part of the desert, of the Nakab uh, desert, that are continuously being harassed and demolished uh, by the state. Uh, and that the violation and the, the violence against Yakub Musa Abul Kiyan is simply a manifestation, an instantaneous manifestation of what uh, is happening. I mean, we were working uh, for years with this community uh, in Al Arakib. Uh, you see, you don't even see those images. They are not mapped on uh, satellite images. Google Earth does not have the names of the villages on it because Israel does not recognize them, although there are about 50,000 people living in those places that I showed you. Um, the resolution of satellite images over Israel is so low that you cannot even see them, and this is the demolition of, um, of Al Arakib. Uh, what we're doing there, uh, again, for a court case that uh, is in support of that community that is being removed, is trying to do something extremely simple. The state says that those villages are unrecognized because those people are squatters on state land, i.e. state land being public land of the state of Israel. Um, the, um, the, the, the state tried to convince the Bedouins that they're Bedouins, i.e. that they're nomads. The Bedouins tried to say, well, you know, I mean, this is your Orientalist imagination. We've been settled for, uh, you know, more than 150 years in this, in this area. And uh, state authorities said, well, you haven't been there. Uh, we did something very simple. We've uh, found um, in, in the archives photographs from RAF in a, during the Second World War, um, 
at the end of the Second World War, the British were bringing back some of the squadrons to the colonial, um, to the colonial frontiers, and they were taking aerial photos of, uh, of Palestine. Uh, these are not to document Bedouin inhabitation in any way. Uh, these are done for uh, cartographic and military purposes. But we were looking at them very carefully to see 1945, three years before the establishment of Israel in 1948, whether we could see the Bedouins in that, in those military photographs, hence they were there before the state, and then who is the squatter on whose land? Uh, so here is a kind of just very, very quickly a part of our analysis uh, showing um, those aerial uh, images, how, how we compose them very much kind of repurposing military techniques. Sometimes we use social media and clips, sometimes we use material that is 70 years old and start looking almost at the level of the pixels, sorry, not pixels, these are grain, salt grain, civil salt, halide grain on the image itself to start picking out the, the, the um, traces of, of Bedouin cultivation, um, they call them nomads, but uh, they're fields, uh, dams, stone houses, and gardens. Uh, again, you see very, very clearly two dams and, and a field uh, between, in between them. Uh, you know, the kind of the popular Orientalist imagination of Bedouin as kind of people that move in an open frontier of the desert is, is completely divorced from reality. The frontier has been closed uh, long ago, uh, and people have anyway, even, even before the hand, um, you know, lived between kind of cultivation and, and, and other processes. Um, wh one thing that we do is some kind of emergency uh, archaeology from the air. Uh, together with an organization called Public Lab, we repurpose kites. We, com we connect to them cameras. They're hanging from the kite. And um, we combine them into, through photogrammetry into very precise three-dimensional models that we overlay onto the, um, uh, the British aerial images in order to show the continuity and because also, Israel, uh, when they demolish those villages, they plant forest over them so that people cannot uh, return. Uh, so we, it, it, it's like a form of uh, emergency archaeology from the air. These are the different survey periods when we went there with our kites. We do it with the community, with children. Uh, we put it on top of the um, uh, uh, aerial images and um, and try to tell uh, this kind of story of, of continuity uh, of inhabitation. Uh, find the wells today that were there before, showing that uh, these are the, the same places. I've taken so much more time over that investigation that I intended to. I really don't know how I'm gonna, finish, how I'm gonna go through uh, this process. But I wanted to show you several other investigation in particular and really, really briefly showed you a different kind of technique that we were using in a completely different area, but still a same kind of confrontation with state authorities and, and denial. We were asked by Amnesty International to um, help them um, model or represent uh, the one, uh, one of the most notorious prisons in Syria, uh, 45 minutes north of Damascus called Saidnaya, uh, a place where uh, regime opponents are incarcerated, tortured, and executed, a place that has never been visited by journalists uh, and human rights um, and reporting groups. Uh, the problem was that the people that uh, were imprisoned there did not even see the building because they were led in uh, blindfolded and using a combination of um, 3D modeling that allow people to recall, i.e. building the model actually build people memory with it, and acoustic uh, modeling done with a member of our team called Lawrence Abu Hamdan, um, we were able to reconstruct uh, the interior of the building and some of what 
has taken place uh, inside of which. I'll show you an example, a quick uh, example of how, uh, in fact, um, uh, architectural modeling of very mundane element could help people access uh, repressed memories that otherwise are too painful to recall. Uh, if you just ask people uh, for their stories, um, people's memories sometimes protect them from the harshest and hardest uh, points uh, of that they've lived through. Uh, here, um, a, a modeler or a, a researcher in our team, Hania Jamal, a Palestinian woman architect, uh, is interviewing um, one of the detainees. She's trying to figure out how to model the door and she asked him um, really about just the dimension and what exists on the door. <laughs> So uh, she asked him to, to model the, the, the hatch on the door and she asked him how big it is and he goes like, it's a bit bigger than my face and then, okay, all of the sudden kind of his body and the architecture kind of combine within this um, principle. You're trying to model it and then at some point uh, a kind of a, a recollection of a form of torture that that person has been subjected to uh, uh, is, is become available or he's, he's telling it. Um, he's been asked, he's, he's sitting in a solitary confinement room with several others and he's asked by a guard on the other side to push his head out uh, of it and um, through the hatch. <laughs> على زي ال هي هذا الزي تبع الشراقة بسموه. and as his head is outside, he's beaten from the other side, um, uh, almost unconscious, and and is unable even to bring his head through uh, that hatch. So this is the kind of recollection that sometimes. Focusing on technical elements within the architecture is a kind of a gateway um, into memory, and we know, you know, we know the long history of the relationship between memory and space, and various technique, mnemotechnics, and of the art of memory that connects uh, recollection, violence, and and space, and this is things that. Um, are very important uh, to us in forensic architecture. Uh, here, Anas, another um, a detainee, uh, is making what we um, understood to be in, in our team, what we understood to be an error uh, in his memory, and I wonder how to understand that. <laughs> So he's beaten outside of uh, his room. At that point, after cross-referencing a lot of uh, those investigate, or a lot of those uh, testimonies, uh, in fact, the, the investigation is uh, coordinated by Christina Vervia, who is here. She's putting these testimonies together, figuring out the architecture of the building. So we understand he's I not mean. in a circular space. This is how we understand the building uh, to be. And, um, and this is pretty much the kind of thing okay. he's he, seeing he on his screen. Here. So 
So we know the space was straight and we know that he understood it to be circular. This is the kind of thing that if you just simply work um, evidentiary in a kind of positivistic way, you'll get rid of those memory errors. But we understand the memory errors to be incredibly rich moments because they describe two things. One is the space itself, but the way it is filtered through trauma uh, and pain. And to a certain extent, the error itself can be even more faithful to the event than a true Cartesian description uh, of what has taken place. And this is why things like that really annoy us. And if there is, I don't understand the combination between, or the combination of those two terms, like the pro-Syria left, uh, but it does exist in London where we are, uh, people believing that, um, you know, um, if, you know, if Syria is, is um, kind of now subject to violence from the West also, that whatever it does is, is, is okay, um, and kind of hound any, anyone revealing human rights violation there as kind of stooges of, um, uh, of imperialism. Amnesty International admits Syria, Sadnaya report fabricated entirely in the UK. I, again, an accusation for us to have fabricated the memory rather than trying to understand the, the methodology and the theory behind it, uh, those kind of attacks, uh, special effects. This is, this is the same accusation that we've seen previously from the Israeli government now coming from our colleagues in universities sometimes. Uh, and then um, Assad himself, uh, because finally that our report that ended up as an interactive platform uh, was very widely seen. Assad had to respond to it and to the Amnesty International report that underpinned it on uh, torture in Sudnaya, and this is what he had to say. The report that you, mentioned, you have mentioned, it was a report made by Qatar and financed by Qatar. Uh, you don't know the source, you don't know the names of those victims, nothing verified about that report. It was paid by Qatar directly in order to verify and smear the Syrian government and the Syrian army. There so, are a lot of eyewitnesses. No one knows who are they. You don't have anything clear about that. It's not verified, so no. So we, we are actually still waiting for this Qatari money, but um, I think that if Assad would know that uh, an, an Israeli was involved in that, there would be even much, um, um, <laughs> he would have a field day, uh, though that obviously is not related. Just to show you that um, an American run or not American run, but American involvement in uh, a detention facility in northern Cameroon. Um, Cameroonian Special Forces, the BIR, is trained by uh, US forces and supplied by Israeli weapon uh, dealers. Um, they are, uh, this is a military base of Salak. Um, the American military admits to being in part of it, only here, um, while Amnesty International recorded uh, torture, execution, and uh, starvation of prisoners within the military base itself. Um, the American military denied all knowledge of those. Uh, thanks to Facebook, that can also operate as a counter surveillance device. Um, and some American uh, service personnel forget to switch off the location manager, uh, location tagging. Uh, we could see uh, this thing. So uh, posted on Facebook, uh, American soldier chilling, um, uh, uh, a, a container with Hebrew um, from the Israeli national um, kind of like uh, shipping company. Uh, we could also identify some gear uh, that was uh, in, in the operation room of, of new kind of drones that uh, we did not, uh, people were not reported were in operation. This is actually something we've later analyzed and published through in The Intercept. Um, here the model simply allows us to verify where the photographs are taken from and what level of access does the American service personnel have into the, the base they claim not to have access to. The and those it's images are all of the sudden from really within this base. Uh, we can locate precisely also, they're expanding it, 
Now you would see an American special forces training the Cameroonian special forces in night goggles, and now a rather comic video showing Americans versus Cameroonian football with night goggles in the middle of the night, uh, playing footballs by bumping into the building in which detainees are tortured. Um, uh, this is the place, this is the base. These are the places where we know uh, American personnel have been seen. These are the photographs, this is when we know that surely that they are. Uh, these are the detention sites and the interrogation room here uh, in red, um, a complete um, uh, kind of like uh, overlay uh, of that that led to an AFRICOM, which is the Africa Command of the American Military Investigation uh, of this uh, case. And um, now they say they didn't know, uh, I don't know, but they say they'll be good from now on. Um, I want to skip um, a two. I don't know what to what to end. With. You know what? I'll, I'll end very quickly with um, this case here. Um, bit out of focus, but still uh, a shop uh, in Kassel, an internet cafe in which, in 2006, uh, a neo-Nazi murder has taken place. Two of three neo-Nazi cell called the NSU entered into the shop and just like ten in 10 other cases uh, shot, um, uh, in this case, a German man, Halit Yozgat from Turkish background, and just like all the other uh, killings are known as the NSU killings uh, that happened in the first decade of the 21st century. Um, they were caught, oh sorry, they were not caught, they committed suicide and got exposed after the, the German police were accusing uh, or were suspecting and investigating only what they call Turkish and Turkish violence, uh, Turkish mafia violence. They did not, could not imagine that Germans would be involved in it. And, uh, and that was very questionable. And what was most questionable in this particular case is that in that particular killing, there was also not only the, the killers and the victim, but there was a, a German Secret Service agent, a member of the Verfassungsschutz, or the Constitutional Protection Force, um, who was present in the cafe. He was sitting here. Here was the, uh, the murdered person was sitting. Here, in this door, um, the killers entered. They shot him twice here. Um, uh, Andreas Stemme, the Secret Service agent, left immediately after the killing, and when he was later identified by the police, probably with a short circuit between the police and Secret Service, and asked why you were there, uh, he said, "I uh, well, I was there, but I haven't heard anything. Uh, I haven't heard the gunshots, and indeed they were shot with silencer. I haven't smelled the gunpowder, and I haven't seen the body when I left and put money money on the on the counter." And then the police said, all right, then, off you go. And, um, you know, the civil society organization, the parents uh, and people supporting them were incredulous. I mean, they, they couldn't believe that um, there was no questions allowed of the presence of a Secret Service, an FBI agent in the site of a killing when this FBI agent is, in fact, in charge of surveying neo-Nazi killing. What happened there? Was he... Was he, was he set up by them? Was he involved in this case? I mean, there, and more question was asked. That has been slapped, 120 years ban on the file until 2134. All questions and all documents regarding the presence of the Secret Service agent in the shop could not have been answered. This is when, in fact, uh, we were commissioned by um, the Citizen Tribunal saying the state is not unable to do it. So activist, member of the community, set up an alternative forum to the juridical one. And um, uh, luckily, immediately, there was a leak. Uh, thousands of documents in German uh, was leaked into the public domain. And uh, of all, all the police investigation was all of a sudden open. And we could reconstruct it and, uh, from photographs and text and did what, what we would do, 
and, and that was to build a 3D model of, uh, of the shop based uh, on this photograph. The shop no longer exists conveniently. It's a honey shop uh, today. Uh, but the photographs uh, from, the, from the morning after, or even from, from the evening, uh, it was shot around 5 o'clock, um, uh, were made available. And we could reconstruct the contours of the space from them. Uh, matching the images onto the space so that we can run a set of experiments uh, within it in order simply to ask that question, is it possible that the Secret Service agent is telling the truth? In counter-investigation, you don't really ask the police question. Not, the question was not who killed Halit Yozgat. We know. The question is only about the police or the state responsibility to it. Uh, and what we decided to do is also to build uh, a, a real life model. Um, who can afford to build something like that? Um, our friends in the art world, um, in the House of World Culture somewhere that, that I think Tom is often uh, lecturing in, uh, were allowing us um, or giving us a nice budget and a space we could build this, uh, the room where the murder has taken place um, we had to abstract some elements, so instead of the windows, we, we brought big uh, glass sheets. This was all worked with acoustic scientists. So some elements are very uh, figuratively one-to-one -one reconstructed. Some are, um, are abstracted. Uh, again, not going too much in detail into it, but when you kill in an internet cafe, you need to know that all your witnesses are online. There were five witnesses in the shop more. And the whole kind of time-space sequence is, is more or less given, allowing us, although there were some controversies to do with it, but allow us a, a very broad contours of, the, of both the space here on the right and the time of, uh, of the incidents. And then what we did is that we had to shoot a gun. Um, in this country, it, uh, in Arizona, it wasn't very difficult to undertake. Uh, we went to an acoustic. Uh, uh, sorry, to a gun expert who shot a, the same pistol for us, both with and um, and, and without a silencer. The Colt 32 with a wet suppressor. You see, I mean, it's a, a silencer is not like in the movies when it's like, I mean, it does, there is some sound coming from it, and that sound was recorded and was played in the space. One. High level gunshot. Start now. This is our acoustic engineer. So we shoot it. Uh, Measurement we don't end. shoot it. We put a, a speaker in Measurement the room. Measurement two. High level gunshot. And we measure shot. it exactly where the, the, now. the agent is sitting. And to cut a long story short, it shows that Measurement end. Uh, it would have awakened a sleeping person. The level of that, of course, you know, we every experiment we undertake, both in physical and in digital space. Um, we undertake also some um, fluid dynamic in order to investigate the threshold of smell. All these investigations are about perception. That room is like a sensorium that we build. It is about investigating the threshold of sound, the threshold of smell, and the threshold of vision. Um, here, uh, what, what the, the most fundamental leak that uh, existed in the police files were re, was a reenactment video. So when, when Andreas Stem and the Secret Service agent was, came there and said, well, I didn't hear, didn't see, didn't smell, the police said, okay, let's reenact it. How, how come you didn't see? Show us how you moved in space. They don't, don't seem to ask very hard questions. They just say, Show us how you moved through space and how come you didn't see a body that was lying right there behind the counter while you leaned over the counter and put a, uh, a 20 cent coin to pay for your time, you know, 20 cent with, with his fingerprints on it. Um, so in this investigation, in fact, the reenactment is not a representation of a crime. It is the crime. The crime happens here on camera. Uh, what we had to do is to reenact the reenactment. A, this reenactment video is just like a video of shooting or bombing anywhere else. Uh, what we did, we motion tracked the eyes uh, that allowed us to um, 
estimate the path of movement of, uh, of his vision uh, in space. And now what you see is um, Andreas Temme reenacting. He's looking. Where is Halit Yozgat? The man is dead. He's already behind the counter. Supposedly, he's looking for him. He wants to pay. He's going to the back of the room. What you see on the right is what he sees. What you see on the left is what he reenacts. We don't think this is what happens, but this is the best case scenario that he presents of how could he not have seen it. So he's looking everywhere else. He's taking the coin from his pocket and places it on the table, and, <laughs> and the body is there. Even in his most kind of like in his favor, the testimony of his body, we also undertake uh, a reenactment uh, with one of our members who is holding a GoPro camera. We couldn't find somebody so tall, uh, so he's holding the camera on his forehead. He's reenacting the same thing. We, we just check it also. Uh, within our model, he's coming back. He's now, um, he's gonna looking. Where's where where where's Yozgat? Um, this is being timed, and Christina is reading time as he is performing that. Uh, he's taking now the twenty cent coin and putting it on the table. <laughs> so, um, of course, um, various technical reasons. Um, it's always technical. Um, we're not presenting in court the state anyway, and the lawyers for the family that lost uh, Halit Yozgat uh, is accusing the court at the end of that in the final closing. So, like, you are you are ending the case. You con they're convicting the one remaining Nazi from this cell, uh, from this neo-Nazi cell. But you haven't asked the important question about the role of the state. You haven't looked at forensic architecture evidence. Uh, we need to find other forums to show this work, and we're invited to Documenta, and Documenta happens in Kassel, about a few hundred meters away from the site of murder, we show this evidence file. Uh, the reviews of Documenta say, uh, this is not uh, art, this is evidence, you know, there's kind of like a bit of a misunderstanding in there, but still a lot of people come, politicians come from the parliamentary uh, commission of inquiry, and they ask it, because it was seen and generated some press, they ask it to be brought into the uh, Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry in the state of Hessen, the state where it happens, the state where that could ask the important question about the uh, files, the Verfassungsschutz, the FBI uh, files. Uh, the CDU, the Christian Democratic Party, in charge of the Secret Service at the time decides to object to uh, the presentation of our evidence in the court, saying the opposite of what the reviewer said it in Documenta, saying this is not evidence, this is art, i.e. it was shown in Documenta, it must be art. Um, and uh, still, it didn't work for them. So now the accusation of fake news come from the German ruling party, Angela Merkel party, this is fake. Uh, has got nothing to do with criminal technology. CDU on the, you know, on the official page, the head of the CDU delegation to the inquiry say, to submit a documenta piece to the NSU examination board did not make the investigation task possible. This art project is not adequate evidence. Another actor, left populist, etc. The whole kind of things that are obviously always leveling, leveled at us. Whenever somebody, we, we, would, we would absolutely welcome a discussion on the evidence. We'd absolutely welcome peer review. We'd absolutely welcome any factual discussion. But the kind of discussion that we encounter are to take us out. We are not allowed to speak. I, we are taken out of the, um, the uh, you know, either politically or because you know, we include artists. Of course, there are scientists also in our group. There are lawyers in our group. It's not only artists, but this is a convenient point. This diagram is representing some a, a very important distinction for us. There is um, the event, the criminal event, the, the the forensic event that we investigate, 
is then there is the event of forensic in a sense of how to present a work, how to, the forensic is, is not only the investigation, it's also making it public. How can you make a work like that public? This is a diagram of where our evidence had to go, the different forums, every channel, every kind of uh, horizontal channel here is a different forum. And the complexity here of that diagram is showing you, and I'm not gonna read it for you, but you know how it is excluded from court, it is entering into the commission of inquiry, into art forums, again, the various maneuvers, if that was simply police forensics, it would be a single horizontal line. We produce work, we presented it in court a long time. When you are working in counter forensic, you have to always maneuver and find alternative ways of speaking. And sometimes making exhibition, and this is our exhibition at the ICA, is a way of opening uh, forums uh, for and making evidence public, taking it out of the simple bureaucratic mechanism of truth production that is within the uh, state courts and institutions and making evidence public. And I think this is something that is very important to understand the um, legal process is only as good or the evidentiary process is only as good as the political process it is part of. Uh, thank you very much for listening. So it's always, uh, it's always my trick to, to speak too long, so there's no embarrassing questions that I have to answer. But I think in that case, we'll take maybe three or four. Three or four. I was told to, to actually choose to ask, and, and to, is anyone? Tom. <laughs> To Istanbul? Oh. Do you know, it's, it's such an interesting case, but that would fall outside of our remit because, you know, there is, Turkish secret services obviously have been eavesdropping on the embassy. There's been states that are involved in that. I mean, we kind of go into a situation where there is um, civil society, in, I mean, there is obviously a civil society interest in it, but already like massive state investigations are undertaken on it that, that you know, at least we feel is are pushing in the right direction. So, you, you know, like when we, when we think about the commissions that we should take or we should not take, and right now in forensic, a, a, a team that kind of like, about 15 of us right now, uh, we are limited in our capacity to take things. Um, we would take investigations only from civil society groups, uh, never from states, and only those things that we think we can contribute something that no one else would do. So, uh, I, I mean, I'd love to do it because I think it's an interesting and horrific story uh, and I think it's it's time to settle some score with the Saudis, but um, yeah. Along the same lines of that question, going further, uh, how do you think we can scale what you're doing? so that it's not just 15 people in the world doing this, but uh, maybe take some of what y your group is doing and expand it or, or have like satellites or other groups maybe, uh, you know, it would, you said this is something that has no center. And I think it's important to, to like, if there are more groups that are doing this, then it truly does feel that way. Yeah, you know, usually the kind of the tendency when you, div when you have an office or a studio is kind of like to protect your techniques and kind of to keep it. Um, uh, we decided to actually undermine ourselves a little bit by thinking about forensic architecture as a field rather than our office. And we, what we do, we train people to do that kind of work. And um, 
And the good news is that we're going to be working in, or well, I don't know if it's a good news, but, uh, you know, I mean, for us, it is interesting because we haven't worked in the U.S., um, but we are starting tomorrow kind of trying, starting to engage with some projects here and indeed would run likely an academy here to train activists. So if anyone in this audience knows how to edit 3D model, animate, and has the energy, persistence, and patience to do this kind of work, um, email us on the, uh, just on, a, on our website, on the info, uh, email on our website, because we're gonna be looking for people here that can do work like that, and uh, hopefully kind of help the people that are already uh, doing amazing journalistic um, and you know forensic investigation uh, here um, increase cap at least technical capacity in in um, visual investigation and representation of things. Over here on your on your left. Um, so obviously, you're doing a lot of work that could that makes heads of state uncomfortable or you know angry to say the least. In light of that, do you ever worry for your safety or for your life? Um, yeah, the short answer is is yes. We 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 try to take the necessary or not even the necessary the possible precaution. Uh, but I have to say, starting from Israel itself, I'm now I'm British or British and Israeli. Um, the risks that, as an Israeli Jew, I would face in Israel are minimal in relation to the risks that the same work that would be done by Palestinian, even a Palestinian citizen of Israel, would would face. So we are privileged to a certain extent, and. We need to kind of use our privileges to undo our privilege, if you see what I mean. That's kind of like a bit of a slogan in, uh, in Israel-Palestine when Jewish-Israeli activists are involved in this kind of work. Um, we need to acknowledge our uh, privilege and somehow um, uh, m make something uh, useful out of it. Um, in other places, uh, sometimes we don't travel. Sometimes we also only are involved in what we call, or what is called now generally, open source investigation um, with organizations such as Bellingcat that work very close to us, um, sourcing material online. I think that increasingly, even if we are able to travel to a place where something happened, by the time that we're traveling there, um, the evidence is contaminated, it's gone. And increasingly, the work of verification operates, as I said, in a kind of multi-perspectival way that is a combination between what people do on the ground, the risks that they take in recording stuff around themselves, in switching on their smartphones and recording even when they know that this is dangerous, even when they know that the military shoot to kill policy is anyone directing camera at the military um, in Syria or in Israel, definitely, in, Palestine, in Gaza, this is the case. Um, still they record and <coughs> upload stuff online. That is the material that is important. Now, we think that we know how to look at images, but we don't. We think that the proliferation of sources by themselves would shed clarity, but it doesn't. We need to develop a certain new visual literacy that is not about only looking at what is in the frame or at the obvious clips that include in the very same frame both perpetrator and victim, but what about all the hundreds or thousands of videos that include only just perpetrator or victim or just sound of that or part of the event or a bit before, a bit after, everything that is necessary to be composed need to be composed or the, the, the system that we've developed to compose it is through architecture. Architecture becomes the arena and the optical device that syncs up all this material. And um, indeed, when you have 
you know, this kind of trophy video of perpetrator and victim, all, all you need to do is verify, locate it, and, and you know, you can use it. Uh, our expertise is actually, you know, almost when you have those videos, you don't need us. Um, we come into um, action when you don't have that. And we've developed a certain literacy in working remotely also with communities on the ground and, um, and, and an ability to, to start seeing outside the frame, if you like. No, not, not what is in the frame, but how can you, how from a camera you can see what is not in the frame by sound, by movement of the camera, by the breathing of the photographer. There's all sort of things in, in those videos that are not, that are beyond what it is that you see and are all important. And people sometimes think that this is just image flotsam, this is just junk, you know, that is not relevant. But somehow uh, combining those things together, as I showed you at the beginning, no? Sound with image, simply that. Sometimes we combine 70 sources together to tell a story. Sometimes just two allow you to, to, to open something up. Anyway, it's a, it's a long, kind of complicated answer to a question that you, you asked uh, about security, and I answer about open source investigation. But to a certain extent, um, they are related. Uh, we've never been to, I've never been to Syria, but we've done a lot of work there. Uh, Sometimes in direct contact, um, sometimes through Twitter, with, with people on the ground that send us material, um, share screen, working out plans, uh, etc. But when we can, we will go. Last uh, or two? Oh, two? Hey there. I'm curious if uh, there are any consistent known unknowns in the field currently and how you're hoping to push the boundaries known of those. Unknowns. Oh, yeah. Uh, known unknowns. Um, well, I, yes, I know, I know, the, I know the, the slogan it's coming from, but like I'm just trying to think about, um, well, I mean, I think one of the, I don't know if it's an unknown known or non unknown or, or what. I mean, it confuses me this formulation. But there is um, there is an increased understanding that seeing or sensing is not only a human, not only referring to a human senses, but we need to integrate an understanding of uh, machine sensing, machine vision, artificial intelligence, pattern recognition. Another thing, especially when we're looking at um, drone warfare uh, and other such actions. So how a human investigator investigates the vision, sometimes the question is what the machine sees, how a machine sees. It doesn't see like a human sees. It's not simply the kind of the combination of tones and it, it sees through numbers, through, uh, through codes and uh, a certain, to a certain extent with a semi-automatic or semi-autonomous, let's say, uh, weapon systems that based on artificial intelligence, partly, partly drones but not only, um, one has to enter into a much more conf you know, the kind of the, 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 the sensorial literacy has to, to increase into understanding that kind of known, unknown, unknown, known of what is the machine seeing? How is it seeing? Is it seeing correctly? How can you somehow subvert it, camouflage from it, or use it for your purposes? Uh, and I think that's one of the frontiers that we are uh, now kind of trying to inhabit. Um, could you speak a little could you speak a little bit to the uh, the process when you're when you uh, when you've decided to take a case um, how you're working with the people who brought the case to you the process for creating the context in which the forensic architecture will be understood um, and if if your firm, or who you know, how, how proactive you are in building 
kind of the, you know, where are you going to be presenting it, who's going to be seeing it, what, um, you know, what the political framing of your evidence will be, how much you do that and how much you take the lead from the people who brought you the case. So I can tell this story, oh, I can tell those stories very easily backwards because then everything feels like it made sense and we planned it to be like this and that and we develop a coherent strategy. We said we'll show it first in the art, then it will open it. Finally, it's, it's, there's a lot of trial and error and not all of those are uh, predefined methodologies. In fact, we rarely do the same investigation again. It's kind of one of our principles is because we are limited in capacity and we have so many requests now is not to do the same investigation twice, but always to go into an unknown situation for us so that we can develop new uh, evidentiary techniques. And not only evidentiary techniques, because the forensic process involves three sites. It happens on the field, uh, the investigation, it happens in the lab, and it happens in the forum. And the, and the kind of, uh, so these are three sites of operation that we need to find new responses within. And, um, and, and we just try to think through a kind of a strategy together internally. We always have those kind of collective meetings when we try to develop a strategy also often with the uh, people that commission us that are sometimes the communities experiencing violence or sometimes advocacy groups like Amnesty uh, etc. We'll develop that. We'll, it will always evolve and change in, res in relation to uh, development on the ground, in, the, in relation to impossibilities and opportunities uh, that, 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 that we get, etc. So we never entering knowing exactly what we do. We never build a coherent strategy and simply follow it. Um, and because each investigation is somehow unique and uh, you need to do it. But backwards, I can rationalize somehow, and we can all rationalize what it is that we've done and what has been successful and what it, I mean, We're kind of brutal sometimes in our own self-critique. Uh, sort of auto-critique is very important for our capacity to take autonomous decision, no? We kind of, it's not that we, you know, we, some of us are, are kind of like critical scholars, part, you know, grew up on, on um, critical inquiries, etc. but like, we turn it inwards, no? I mean, we, what we do to the state is not critique. We kind of like, we try to confront them. The critique we reserve to ourselves uh, and um, try to be as honest as possible with our failures. Thank you very much for listening. It was really fun to be here.